Welcome to One Mind Zen Hermitage. Trying to capture the living Dharma in discursive thought and language is like trying to capture and keep a firefly in a jar. Um, and we may also feel that way these days, cooped up in our homes during the pandemic. Um, we might see this as an opportunity for practice, but for many people who have suddenly had the external objects of their attachment pulled away from them, find themselves alone with their unruly minds and dreadful thoughts. Our society's narrow identification with form has resulted in this fixation on mind objects that triggers fear, mistrust, and enmity we see all around us. Even we as practitioners of Zen are touched by this. It's happening all around us. It impacts our relationships and our state of mind. Today's, I'm go today's subject is going to be sati, which translates as mindfulness, usually in English, but a better translation is presence at least according to Jack Cornfield. Um, I, I would like to illustrate how even the most diligent students of, of Zen need to work through object consciousness into space consciousness, emptiness, or mindfulness, if you will. Uh, case 52 of the Blue Crypt Record recalls a story about the great master Matsu, known in Japan as Basu, who was out walking with his student, who also became a great master, Pai Chang, known as Chakujo in Japanese. The name of this is Pai Chang's Wild Duck, and it's not about Chinese food. Um, what's happening here, by way of background, is that the Zen students in the monastery would work in the fields to raise their own food, something that was a new development in Buddhism because prior monks had been forbidden to uh, raise their own food and they had to beg for alms. That was not supported in Chinese culture. So they would work in the fields. And this gave them an opportunity to be alongside the master. And occasionally there would be an opportunity for a kind of uh, spontaneous uh, interview, which we call today Dokusan, or student-teacher interview. So here is the poem. One day, the great Matsu, master Matsu and Pai Chang were walking together, and they saw a wild duck flying. Pai Chang said, what was that? Or rather, Matsu said, what was that? Pai Chang answered, wild duck. And where is it? Matsu asked. Oh, it's flown away. It's gone. At that point, Matsu reached out, grabbed Pai Chang's nose, twisted. Pai Chang yelled out in pain. Flown away, Matsu said, since when has it ever flown away? So what was happening here? Matsu was testing Kyakujo's state of presence, his mindfulness. When he asked what was overhead, Matsu had observed it. It was a wild duck. He could have said, oh, I'm, I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. I was thinking of something else. But he said it was a wild duck. So then Matsu Drew him into duality by asking, where is it? Pai Chang said, 
Well, it's going the way it's gone. But was that a present answer? What is a way? In relation to what? If you are not the center of the universe, how can things fly away? What is this sense of separation from all things? Ultimately, aren't you the space in which Hai Chang, Matsu, and the wild duck arise? Or do you narrowly identify with this set of thoughts and feelings, this self? Well, Andre Hallo in his book, his great little new book, The There Is No You, talks about the protagonist myth. And I'm going to read you a paragraph from it. We are all the main characters of our own stories, which orbit around us in the same way as the moon does the earth. It's as if all of the people in our lives serve only to advance our story arc. So, how can anything really be separate? What would the right answer have been? I don't know. And maybe that would have been the right answer, or any kind of answer that would have indicated to Matsu that Pai Chang was present and not lost in abstraction. So, how present are we? And is the Dharma for us that sort of discernment? that cuts through the mental swamp? Or is it another accoutrement that we cling to? If we identify with it as a thought form, then it can bind us to dukkha and suffering. Trying to capture reality through the mind an intellect is like trying to capture a firefly in a jar. If we capture it, have we captured the mysteries of its being? Do we capture how it interacts with its environment, the miraculous ways in which it interacts with other plants and beings, and that they sustain one another? If we keep it in a jar, separate from that, can it even continue to exist? Well, think of thought as the surface of the stream. Our goal is to see within, but too often don't we just wind up agitating the surface of it with our thought? Only in stillness can we see our depth. And how can we then return to stillness? Well, one way is disidentification from form, deriving from loss, suffering, and disillusionment. Maybe not the nicest. But if you're feeling any of these things, take part, because it is what the sixth patriarch, Benang, experienced when he had his great awakening. It's what Eckhart Tolle experienced before he awakened. I even have a, a story that I can relate to. When I returned to live in Korea for four years, after ha having been away for a decade or so. Um, I had been a practicing Buddhist for several decades, since my teens. But when I saw the behaviors of the Chilge order monks and their politics, I was turned off and I completely disidentified with Buddhism. I was no longer calling myself a Buddhist. 
I continued, though, to practice mindfulness and chamsan, or zazen, meditation. And then on returning to the States four years later, um, and then a few years after that, my wife was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So the burden of the imminent loss of everything I held dear in this life was really something to bear. But then one day, I came to radical acceptance. I was reading the first chapter of A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle, in which he related a Buddhist story, the story of Mahakatyapa. Upon seeing the Buddha hold up a flower, he became enlightened. Suddenly, on reading that, I was launched into emptiness without any warning, just suddenly. Suddenly, all my fears, cogitations, pain, suffering, burst. And I maintained that state of emptiness for over a year. Any time that I was pulled back into unconsciousness, there was a mental switch I could move. And I could return to emptiness. Well, had I continued to cling to the outer forms of Buddhism, I would have continued to build a story around myself being a protagonist of some great Zen adventure. And that would never have happened to me. It's like the story of... Uh, Nanin, the Japanese master who was entertaining a professor and poured him a cup of tea. After the cup was full, he kept pouring until the professor questioned him and he said, like this cup, you are full of your own opinions and speculations. How can I show you Zen unless you first empty your cup? So, what flips the switch for us? Gateways to awakening are numberless. We recite this when we meet. We say opportunities for awakening are endless. I vow to master them all. We already know how to refocus from thinking into bodily sensations. We use the breath for that or the hada. We can feel it in the sensations of our palm. And by returning our attention to these bodily sensations, this sense of aliveness that we feel there, we can shut off the mind stream and enter emptiness. The earliest known teachings of the Buddha on meditation are on the, the body, meditations and feeling the body. Another doorway to awakening would be to be aware of a negative association and thought when it arises and to transform that into a mindful embrace. For example, there was a time when I stereotyped a particular individual. Um, that person just rubbed me the wrong way and I disliked him. So, the way in which I dealt with that was to be aware of that condition and instead turn my attention to a mindful embrace of that person, understanding that person's oneness with myself. So in that way, I was able to break the associations in my mind and generate oneness. So to conclude, let me just say that when we cling to objects as proxies for self, we really are trying to locate ourselves in them. 
And we're capturing, we're trying to capture a firefly in the jar. Keep it alive. Open the jar. Let the firefly free. And as that line from the Diamond Sutra, that awakened painting states, let your mind flow freely, attaching to nothing.